Madhagi Arun and I will be moderating this discussion. The reason we choose this topic, platform engineering on Kubernetes, is because Kubernetes has been the cornerstone for modern application deployment and management. It has revolutionized the way we build, scale, and deploy application in the cloud IT world. So during the course of this discussion, we are planning to cover the following aspects, which is automation, reliability, scalability, monitoring, and more importantly, how to enhance developer experience. So we have with us the eminent panelists who are going to share their experience, insights, and life lessons learned during the course of their journey. So we are going to tap into their expertise to understand real life problems and how to overcome them. So before we move on to the discussion, I would request the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. So I'll start with Bala here. Morning all, I'm Bala. I'm Orca's senior SRE in Zscaler. I'm happy to sh share this stage with our Kubernetes gurus. Yeah, that's it. Thank, thank you, Bala. Hi, uh, yeah. hi everyone. I'm uh, Matunika. I'm working with Ericsson, and I'm a senior application analyst there. So uh, my experience with Kubernetes has been uh, relatively new. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. I'm Krishna. I'm a part of the uh, modernization group in Infosys, and as a part of CNCF, I'm working with the Spiffy Spy project and uh, tax security. I look forward to the discussion with all of you here. First of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm Arul, uh, working as an engineering lead for Tata Communication, uh, where primarily I'm focusing on uh, building the cloud native application in the customer experience domain. Hey, hi everyone, I'm Mohan. I'm a lead software engineer at Avalara. I've been building a distributed crawling engine, a crawling platform for the last five years. Yeah, look forward to discussing platform engineering with everyone. Vanakam Chennai, uh, thank you for having all of us here. Pleasure to be part of this panel. My name is Ram. I am the Chief Evangelist at the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Yeah. Thank you, panelists, for introducing ourselves. And uh, I'll start with the first question here. So I'll start with the very basic. So what do you mean by the term uh, cloud native? Of course, Arun, the term cloud native uh, become a buzzword these days, uh, right? Uh, uh, but it was introduced a decade ago uh, at the AWS reinvent event by Netflix. Uh, since its introduction, it doesn't had a clear definition, meaning sometimes different things for different people. Uh, However, after CNCF establishment, now we have a very clear definition and trail map for the uh, enterprise cloud native journey. Uh, so basically, this cloud native technology uh, empowering organization to build uh, and run scale of scalable application in the modern uh, dynamic environment, right? Such as a uh, public, private, hybrid clouds. Uh, so. If you want to uh, specifically uh, for your question, yeah, my quest, my would be what specific, does it mean? Yeah, uh, in this platform engineering topic, like how do you cloud associate native with, yeah, application, yeah. right? Let's consider a scenario, okay? Uh, I have a legacy uh, monolithic application. I simply put it in the cloud. Okay. That cannot be considered as a cloud native application. Okay. Okay. So. Let us assume that, just to illustrate this conference call, uh, there may be few folks who were born and bred in Chennai. They are called native to Chennai, okay. right? Because they, are, they know every nook and corner of this city. Okay. Uh, the same way, when we say cloud native application, uh, that should leverage all the best aspect of the cloud. Thanks for covering the basics by taking uh, audience as an example, <laughs> Arun. <laughs> so moving on to the next question. I think Kubernetes has become the de facto platform for uh, modern application development and management. So my next question in this regard will be, what are some of the considerations and challenges that we need to take into account while architecting a Kubernetes platform? Yeah, so when you're architecting a platform or Kubernetes, my first question would be why? Why do you want to build a platform? Because since Kubernetes came out in 2000, uh, 
2015, uh, there has been what I would call a pass fever, right? Uh, you, you've had literally hundreds of passes and you know over time some of them had a legit purpose to exist, they still exist, most of them went away, right? And some of these things that started as a pass, like OpenShift, actually you know became a Kubernetes distribution in the end. And then after the pass wave you had the serverless movement which once again was just a pass. Right, and that also has fizzled out. Now you have, uh, let's say, platform engineering. I mean, that, the platform engineering term is grey on both the sides. You know, it, it, we don't know where it starts, we don't know where it ends. But over the last few months, what it has come to mean is is that you know everybody wants to build their own Kubernetes distribution inside the company, which is very unfortunate because you, in 99% of the cases, you shouldn't be building a Kubernetes distribution inside your company unless you know you have very specific use cases. Uh, you, you would be really better off just buying something off the shelf or even for that matter having a managed Kubernetes service from EKS or GKE, something like that. And I would even go further and say, you know, give your teams, give your different organizations separate Kubernetes clusters. Okay, but would it, having an in-house Kubernetes platform give us a much required customization? That is true, but there are only so many ways you can customize it. Given the number of distributions you have, somebody else would have already made a product out of that. And somebody else would already have something uh, that fits your needs most of the time. So that way, you know, in terms of customization, I don't think you will have a lot of benefits, but you still might have some benefits. But, but there, there is also uh, the other angle, right? The standardization, mostly they do this platform as an engineering or standardization, but in a large company, you generally would have different teams with different requirements. One person would want to use, let's say, Linkerd for some reason, and another another team would want to use Istio. So even within a large organization, you would have teams of very varied, um, I would say, you know, requirements. And uh, by asking them to standardize, most of the time you are just restricting something. You know, all of you, pretty sure, hate writing YAML. Imagine writing YAML for something that you you didn't choose. That's just going to be more, uh, you know, more daunting, I would say. Okay. Okay. Maybe my follow-up question in this regard would be like, uh, you want to, you want to, yeah. Yes, uh, I just wanted to sort of um, add something to that. Um, I'm totally echoing what um, Mohan is saying. It is to always start with the why, right? Why, why are we doing this? And let me just give you a, like a small example. Um, suppose you have a client and um, they are asking for 99.999, right? The the mythical 59 of you know availability. You are left with five minutes of downtime a year that you've got to plan for, right? You've got to plan for a platform that just has five minutes of downtime a year. 9.995, you get 20, 25 minutes. 9.95, you get maybe four and a half hours. In order to achieve just five minutes downtime, you need to be multi-region, multi-cluster. You've got to have global load balancing. You've got to hot backup all your data to your you know, secondary region. You've got to do all this, and it's going to cost you a lot of money. right? So suppose you had that conversation in the first or second month of your project, going to the customer and saying, hey, I can give you 9.999. It's going to cost you. 200k a year more. What is your customer going to say, right? So here's where I, I really think and encourage people to do these calculations ahead of time. Think through the engineering ahead of time. You have a lot of control at the requirements engineering stage, which you may not have later on during your platform engineering life cycle. So here's where I'm pretty much echoing what you're saying. You know, start with a why. You know, do you want to build a distribution? Why? Do you want to do HA across regions? Why? Right? So. 
I think they both are in the same team, I guess. Maybe <laughs> they should be separate. <laughs> okay. So, my next follow-up question in this regard would be, so, organization is going to have a combination of both multi-cloud and hybrid cloud platforms. So, in that case, how, do, how does the organization manage this? Like, they need to manage clusters and deploy them spread across multiple cloud environments. So, what are some of the challenges or considerations that we need to take into account while doing this? Maybe, Ram, your thoughts? There's a funny story uh, about the term multi-cloud being invented by a marketing person who used to work at the Cloud Foundry Foundation uh, about 10, 12 years ago. But that being said, um, I think a multi-cloud strategy, whether or not you're using Kubernetes, is you know kind of inevitable. There's no one-size-fits-all cloud. Um, most companies that I speak to and most CTOs that I interact with use a combination of uh, DO for testing, AWS or Azure on production, not to demean the other providers out there. But um, And there's also a ton of people who are very sensitive to like Europe-based vendors for European um, markets. And uh, you know, the, the, the multi-cloud strategy is kind of inevitable. And that all points to wanting like a more common platform based strategy so your teams are not thinking about what clouds they're deploying to your teams are thinking about deploying to kubernetes and kubernetes has done wonderfully for standardizing that experience across different cloud vendors and different vm compute um, types and things like that and so the best way i think to tackle multi cloud in this era is to use kubernetes obviously but that also comes with a lot of caveats and problems, which you know we have to uh, take the bull by its horn and try and solve. So, in the case of uh, multi-cloud, right? My next question here would be like, how do we like uh, those who are preferring to have some kind of an uh, enterprise product or product that is already there in the market? So, how do we bridge this gap? Like, there could be one solution that is available in one cloud, and that same solution may be. Uh, what is it masked with another name in another cloud? So how do we do about this? Yeah, so one of the unfortunate things about the open source world, and it's kind of like uh, a curse that follows us around, is fragmentation. Yeah. Um, we've seen it with Android, we've seen it with Linux back in the day, we've seen it with uh, so many other products along, and now we're seeing it with Kubernetes, not something new. The only sort of sane path there is to Keep experimenting with you know what's available in the market, check out more projects and products and things like that, and try and find other open source solutions that can help okay. there's uh, there's definitely a ton of solutions out there that are open source that solve the problem and to some of the things that Mohan was highlighting before, they do solve the specific problem of being composite or composable where you want to swap out one component for another and things like that. So I would definitely encourage people to you know, continue to investigate in the open source world and uh, make those decisions when they have to come to it. Okay. Krishna? Yeah, long Versus foiled by the bank. <laughs> but anyways, um, so uh, the Kubernetes um, being a foundation of your platform is almost inevitable at this stage. Um, you might look at options. Um, there are other orchestrators available. But if you are doing um, container-based development, then it is inevitable that you'd be deploying to Kubernetes. In terms of Kubernetes, um, this is something that my colleagues at, uh, or rather my friends at Red Hat say a lot, right? I mean, think of Kubernetes as an engine, right? Um, you need to build the car around it. So um, you might first want to look at other projects within the cloud native landscape, which is the CNCF landscape, to pick and choose what to build your platform with. And after that, go outside. Um, we are doing um, a review of, an annual review of all the sandbox projects within CNCF. And there are 
amazing, amazing innovations happening within Sandbox, within incubating, and of course the graduated projects. So um, the suggestion is pick and choose, build your platform. If you choose within the CNCF landscape, you can be fairly sure that they play well together. I want to add again, when we say platform engineering on Kubernetes, right? I, I, I want to go back to the basic again. Uh, so the cloud native, right? Uh, basically the cloud native application, uh, the applications are designed, architected to take leverage the uh, advantage of the dynamic nature of the cloud infrastructure, right? So platform engineering on Kubernetes, Right. Basically, it's set up practice, principles, and uh, technology uh, that enable uh, applications are designed, deployed specifically for the cloud environment. Okay. The cloud native, uh, in the context of Kubernetes platform, basically to leverage all the capability uh, provided by the Kubernetes to build uh, scalable, resilient, and highly available applications. So probably we can take just two characteristics of uh, you know, cloud native application and Kubernetes capability. So one of the key characteristics of uh, the cloud native application, microservice architecture, right? Using microservice architecture, applications are broken down into the uh, smaller, yeah. individual services so that it can be developed, deployed, scaled individually. The another important aspect, containerization. So when we containerize our application uh, with a tool like Docker, that become a portable and consistent across uh, different environment. To uh, ma effectively manage these container, uh, Kubernetes, platform become the popular choice for cloud native application. Mm -hmm. So uh, each individual microservices uh, that can be uh, scaled based on, dem on yeah. demand uh, okay. with the capability offering by the horizontal scaling in the Kubernetes. We can talk more, okay. uh, but in yeah. summary, uh, when we adopt cloud native approach and uh, underlying platform as a Kubernetes, uh, organization can uh, build resilience, they can achieve uh, the greater agility, scalability, um, and you know, efficiency in the overall their software development and deployment practices. I think thanks all for your valuable inputs. I think the audience would have gauged like what exactly needs to be done when we, when they go for deployments, Kubernetes deployments across multi-cloud platforms. So I'll move on with the next question here, and this will be on application deployment and management. So in this context, right, like any application that is being deployed on Kubernetes, we need to automate the deployment, and also like we need to find a way to upgrade and roll back the application in an efficient way. So my next question here would be, what are some of the best practices or tools that we can adapt to manage an application lifecycle within Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, from an application development point of view, like we have reached a point where cloud providers uh, provide uh, like features such that you can just automate your deployment by just changing the manifest. But that alone is not enough because as applications grow, you have a lot of microservices. In that case, you have to at this point in platform engineering where it's not uh, solid, you have to uh, look up to tools like uh, open source tools like Helm or Customize. Uh, that is the way f uh, forward for it. Like Helm is a graduated project in CNCF for a reason because it's like the most used uh, package manager and like even Helm has some drawbacks like it can be cumbersome, uh, cumbersome for it, like for uh, developers to manage when the charts grow. Even we have declarative, declarative specifications like Helm file to manage that. So for most of the uh, drawbacks, you have uh, solutions forward. So uh, to go ahead with that would be an ideal choice at this point. And uh, in that context, some of the best practices would be like maybe uh, separate your uh, configurations like environment configuration, application specific configuration, and your global configuration. That would help uh, better in management and like 
uh, even before starting you can you have to identify your dependencies and declare those so that you don't you you're not in for a surprise at a later point in time uh, and uh, other things would be like make use of uh, features that the tool provides like dry run and uh, for debugging and for uh, other things like uh, the plugins that they provide for maybe you can uh, use those plugins to uh, for secret management to interact with other uh, credential managers like vault so you have almost uh, many of the use cases covered in these tools so it would be better to go for such uh, open source uh, tools would be uh, my suggestion looks like helm is like a kind of a practical solution available now and uh, its advantages way down the disadvantages currently i guess so the next thing that i want to discuss here is about the buzzword in the market in the recent days which is uh, internal developer platform so can someone share their thoughts about this internal developer platform yeah i believe the internal developer platform idps uh, are the huge having the huge value uh, especially in the cloud native software development uh, right by providing uh, self service portal uh, infrastructure to the developer within the organization uh, idps can streamline the entire development process and improve productivity and collaboration uh, across the organization so i i i think idp the platform engineering has a huge opportunity currently i have seen that according to the gartner uh, this platform engineering wave 80% of it companies involve uh, this uh, platform idp by 2026 with the promise of uh, you know like a optimizing developer experience uh, and improving uh, overall the product delivery and uh, like <clears throat> increasing basically increasing value to your end user thank you thank you i hope yeah you want to add on yeah, yeah. yes so i i have a different opinion over there firstly gartner says a lot of things like that <laughs> you don't trust gartner yeah <laughs> i'll probably <laughs> tell you more about that off screen so and secondly you know when you say idp again it's just like platform engineering different people for different people it means different things but what i see commonly on the internet is people building putting together monitoring tools uh, logging log searching tools uh, kubernetes distribution all these things they are putting together and they are calling it an internal developer platform and then you also have this trend uh, called i mean not a trend uh, a very sensible thing to do in fact called platform as a product right you have to treat platform as though it is a product on its own and all your internal users are the, are your customers at at face value it sounds really good but why do you want a, a good chunk of your company's resources involved in maintaining a platform that is not your core competency right so i mean eventually if in a few years time what would happen is depending on whether it's a, a good cycle or a bad cycle uh, you know execs or vcs are going to say you know why don't we either shut this team down and use a vendor or they are going to spin this out as a separate company right yeah. so and all these come we saw this happen with the data platforms right hortonworks cloud are all these were one way or the other internal teams in a different company confluent databricks all these companies i think if we uh, i mean whatever internal platform engineering teams we have uh, looking at history i think that's what would happen to them too yeah. just i want to add that uh, whether we want to keep part of our company or external uh, that's all together different thing uh, but uh, as a someone from the product engineering team uh, i can share my pain point how uh, this idp really helping so when we try to release our product mvp version okay so sometime when everything owned by the engineering team right there are numerous nuances uh, need to take care uh, particularly for this cloud native uh, infrastructure uh, that's very complicated sometimes you know our business uh, want to release the feature quickly uh, to get the feedback from the customer uh, but often uh, they lack of understanding on the non functional requirement uh, like your security 
performance, scaling, uh, right? That, that's become a, a bottleneck for the engineering team. Uh, so because we want to uh, do all these consideration uh, that eventually add a lot of cognitive load on the team. Uh, what my opinion, uh, probably IDP uh, rem removing the cognitive load on the product team uh, uh, by abstracting all your infrastructure layer, uh, whether you are GCP or uh, AWS or uh, hybrid on-premises, everything will be taken care by this uh, platform. So it allowing uh, developer uh, can create cluster, namespace, whatever resources they want through the self-service portal, right? So what I see that that will significantly improve overall the product team productivity uh, so that they can focus more on their uh, feature, what really the customer they want. You want to add it? Yeah. So One small point on this, because you touched upon abstraction. I think in this industry, uh, for some reason or the other, abstraction is always touted as a good thing. But in reality, it is a double-edged sword, right? When you create an abstraction, when you hide complexity behind an abstraction, eventually that abstraction is going to leak and you need to look behind the curtain, right? And what would happen at the time, like people would know, people would not know what they are dealing with because imagine if they had been dealing with AWS console or AWS CLI from the beginning, they would know what they should be doing. But if you have abstracted that in an internal CLI tool or an internal panel, uh, when when uh, when you want to do something and that panel doesn't do it, you have to go to the, to the AWS panel and you wouldn't know what to do. And so uh, when you're creating abstractions, you need to look at the net value that the abstraction is providing. And in many cases, the, it, it is a net positive, but if you are not being careful, it could be a net negative. It, it will add more complexity and more problems down the, down the line than it would otherwise. So when building, I, I mean, I, I, I sure believe IDP and internal development platform is something every company should look to create. I think we also need to be more careful on what that is. Krishna, your thoughts? Yes, so um, the way I look at a trend, right, and um, try to figure out whether it's being held up by hawa, right, hot air or, uh, or a real need is to see what it's addressing, right, what's the pain point. And one thing that we do not realize, because we are all technology enthusiasts, we love Kubernetes, we love CNCF, we love Docker, we love, we love getting into technology, we love working with technology. One thing that we don't understand is that Kubernetes has been great for operations, right? Operations teams love Kubernetes because now we no longer need to tend to a screaming server at you know, 2 a.m. in the morning. We no longer need to follow a Word document with 35 steps to deploy our application. That's no longer required, right? Operation teams love Kubernetes. But developers face challenges because they are coders, they are application specialists, they are programming language, programming tool specialists, and now suddenly they have to learn Docker, they have to learn Kubernetes, they have to understand pods, deployment, stateful sets, all this sort of thing, right? So life has become somewhat more complicated for developers. So what internal developer platforms are doing are really addressing this need for developers to have a smoother experience with our platform. Another thing that you might notice is that Backstage is all the rage now, and Backstage it has really sort of um, broken through because there is a real need underneath for internal developer platforms, and every company has a version of internal developer platform. They're just doing it in an incomplete ad hoc way, right? So now someone is doing it in a more standardized way, and everyone is sort of attracted by that, right? So to summarize, I do see the need I do see the pain points that we are trying to solve using this. The need for standardization is there though. We should not be reinventing the wheel every time. And I just want to give a shout out to Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry got developer experience right a decade, to, you know, more than a decade ago, right? So Cloud Foundry, the whole concept is you worry about the application, 
we'll worry about the platform, right? So I'll just maybe let Ram jump in here. Yeah, now that we're getting to the Republic TV part of the panel <laughs> discussion. Uh, but anyhow, I, I thank you for the shout out to Cloud Foundry. I was not sure yeah, if it was appropriate or not for me to do it. But um, a couple of things I wanted to add to the whole discussion is there is a tag app delivery that's a part of the CNCF. So CNCF has uh, tags that are like SIGs, uh, but they're also like focused on certain aspects and areas. And within the tag app delivery, there's WG platforms and WG operators. So there's different working groups that are tackling the exact problems that we're discussing. Is a platform right? Is a platform wrong? Is a platform right for a small team? Is a platform right for a big team? Do we want ops as its own discipline? So there are a bunch of questions that we need to ask ourselves as a community of technologists before we jump into saying everybody needs a platform. I don't think anybody is saying that. Some teams need platforms because of reasons X and Y. Some teams definitely don't need platforms because of reasons X and Y. And I think it's very fuzzy to the community at large whether or not they need certain things. And so this also harks back to the opening line with which the discussion started, which is, do teams even need Kubernetes? Ninja to Solupa means I don't think a lot of us are going to be able to answer that. Obviously, I'm not going to, you know, continue on this vein at a Kubernetes community day and risk not being invited to the next one. But truth be told, that is the reality for a lot of teams. So if folks are interested in this discussion and this train of thought, I would highly encourage them to participate at tag app delivery in working group platforms or working group operators. Yeah. I think to summarize, I think we had mixed opinions from the panelists. I would leave it to the audience to decide and pick whatever is best fit for them. So I'll move on to the next question. So any application should at some stage move their application into production. So I will move on to some of the challenges that we might encounter when we move an application to production. So and here comes a key part, which is monitoring and observability. So my next question in this regard is, uh, with regards to monitoring, what are some of the best tools and best practices that are available in the market to monitor not only the Kubernetes cluster as, and also the applications that are deployed in it? Yeah. Uh -huh. As Arun, you exactly said, monitoring and observability. You know, observability is part of, yeah. uh, monitoring is part of observability. Yeah. So observability is a definite part in any microservice architecture, whether it is Kubernetes, cloud services, anything. So it is an, you know, a de facto thing. It has to be there. If it is not there, at times of risk, it is really hard for us to troubleshoot anything. So we can primarily uh, divide observability into three key areas or key three pillars, like monitoring the metrics, uh, gathering central logging systems, and then having a distributed tracing for our applications and also for some Kubernetes components also. So the main thing is, uh, you know, observability is, the scope and definition of observability varies from organization to organization based on their product and also their use cases. For example, in our company, we have an internal policy of not having the observability stack inside the application stack itself. You know, so what we have is we doesn't run Prometheus as an operator service inside the Kubernetes. Rather, we have a dedicated uh, Prometheus and Grafana stack outside of Kubernetes. So one use case or good thing is even if a total outage in Kubernetes, you know, we get some alerts from the alerting manager, which is outside of Kubernetes. So instead of, you know, blindfold the whole total outage, we will get some insights. And also the, you know, the pre-configured metrics will also be there. So we can have some, uh, a small visibility if it is outside. So it is like use cases like varies about organization logging. And speaking on centralized logging systems, you know, as Krishna said, unless until we, we need something like an SLA of 99.59, uh, we doesn't need an, a robust centralized logging system, which needs a pipelines, Kafka, low and low ten, latency uh, pipelines to stream the logs and all. We can have a simple RSYS log, which is running in each server, just to send the uh, logs to, uh, to a centralized area. A simple, a much more easier, easier is okay. If we go for ELK and EFK and all, it is good, it is hard to maintain, complex, and it is resource intensive. Uh, most of the Kubernetes cluster doesn't need that, unless until we go for multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environments. Also the same thing applicable for tracing also. Uh, it is, to gain deep insights of any application, we definitely need distributed tracing, but 
we doesn't need tracing for Kubernetes components. We doesn't need agar or tempo to be deployed on Kubernetes and gather metrics of API servers. This is all not needed for each and every use cases. You know, rather we can leverage the existing tools like uh, service mesh. Most of the service mesh offers uh, traces. They will uh, give the traces based on EPBF and existing Kubernetes parameters itself. We d need, don't need additional resources for that. Uh, if we need, you know, uh, deep application insights, we can deploy uh, traces, distributed traces like agar, and then collect uh, metrics. The main issue with that is instrumentation, because each thing, each, uh, each, you know, observability stack allows for different instrumentation. Even Tempo doesn't allow open telemetry. Of course, all the companies are migrating to open telemetry, and open telemetry is becoming the open standard. But still, there are some issues. Uh, for example, you know, there are an interesting product called Pixie, which will allow, it is only Kubernetes based. So it will, instead of allowing instrumentation, it will give us traces based on EPBF and Kubernetes APIs. Based on this, how the application interacts with QB, uh, Kubernetes APIs, it will give us traces. So these are all some interesting tools. Also, the primary pillar for uh, observability, I guess, is alerting. If you have a robust monitoring systems, traces, everything, if it doesn't have alerting system, a good alerting system to you know, alert the uh, definite KPIs, critical KPIs, then it is, it is of no use, right? If it doesn't have a good alerting system, and be, on top of alerts, we can also do automations. So this will kind of, you know, have a self-remediation factor. So based, if we know this alert is happening, we can easily remediate based on run books and playbooks. Also, there are some good tools like BotCube and Robusta, which will take this to next level. Like if you're traveling or we are on vacation, if we have some severe issues in our Kubernetes cluster, we can easily, you know, in a Slack message itself, we can troubleshoot and also resolve the issue. It is, there are security concerns, but you know, if it is <laughs> apart from it, but it is easy to manage the, uh, in, on the go, we can easily manage the community services. I think Bala is an SRE himself. I think he is yeah. uh, sharing his day-to-day -day <laughs> tips and tricks to us. <laughs> so I would move on to the next question here, which will be about security. So security is like kind of a crucial aspect for any platform, and Kubernetes is no exception. So my question here would be like, what are the ways we can secure the Kubernetes cluster and also the applications that are deployed on it? Great. So um, another situation where Cloud Native actually introduces a bit of complexity to the platform. Um, uh, stay with me here, right? Um, security is all about the controlling the ingress and egress, controlling the number of layers, minimizing the attack surface area. What are we doing with Cloud Native architecture? Um, we have bare metal, on top of which we have VMs, on top of which we have an orchestrator, we have container manager on top of which our applications are running. So you are increasing the surface area of attack for any attacker to come in into your system. So to address that, you need to have cloud native security tooling also. There's a lot of work being done in this space. Uh, OPA is an amazing tool. It's a CNCF project. OPA Gatekeeper will allow you to set policies on your cluster. Falco, again, is an amazing CNCF uh, product or project. And it will allow you to do runtime monitoring. But what I want to sort of bring out is, with cloud native platforms, you are entering a whole new era of um, managing, maintaining security. It's not just about CVEs. It's not just about firewalls. Instead, you need to secure each and every layer with policies, with scanning, with effective remediation, which again requires you know, great you know, deployment tooling like Helm and pipelines. Because you got a severe CVE in your application, you don't want to wait for you know, 10 days to get it fixed. You want to do it right then and there, right? So these are all like the various layers that you need to think of in order to um, secure Kubernetes-based platforms. 
I would recommend definitely the work that's being done by Tax Security. Um, I would recommend OPA, Falco, um, uh, Tetragon. Cilium is actually doing a project which uses eBPF for runtime monitoring. Uh, so I would definitely recommend that anyone, right, who's using these platforms, they familiarize themselves with some of this tooling and the concepts of um, security. Um, it, is, it is becoming across our clients, I'm seeing that it is becoming a number one concern that clients come, come to us with now. And to address that, we have effective tools, but we really need a lot of awareness among the team, among the people running, running the platforms. I think we should make use of these tools to be and be proactive in this uh, side of this. So I'll move on to the next question. So any platform is going to have some limitation and Kubernetes is no exception. So my next question here is what are some of the limitations or improvements that we need to see in Kubernetes and like how can we improve them to make it a better platform? Like do, we, do you guys have any wish list as such to have or want to see in Kubernetes? There's uh, about 1,700 open issues <laughs> on their <laughs> GitHub repo. So obviously, uh, getting through those uh, at the earliest is, uh, is something that would be good. But that being said, in the process of resolving those, there'll probably be 1,800 issues that are open. And so I think, uh, by and large, the Kubernetes community is doing extremely well in terms of being very open and responsive in the way they are improving the platform day in and day out. There are some things that I would definitely like to see, um, but rather than come at it from the more technical direction, um, there's a lot of work that I think can be done to improve the onboarding experience for not just Kubernetes itself, but for the entire CNCF ecosystem as a whole. Um, it's wonderful to see a massive landscape with trillions of dollars in, I don't know, market cap value, whatever. Uh, but the, that, that, that comes with a difficulty where it's not easy to comprehend what path a developer would like to take uh, as they start to navigate this landscape. And so if there are enthusiasts among this audience, among those watching, among those uh, out there in the world who want to come up and say, uh, there's something that we can do in order to educate people better about these platforms and these individual tools working together, working two at a time, working four at a time, and completing a more sane, useful experience, then I think that would be something very nice to have. That being said, uh, on the technical side, there are a few projects that I did follow. For example, the whole notion of doing multi-tenancy on Kubernetes, which is also being done through SIGs and working groups and things like that. The notion of multi-tenant Kubernetes vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, like there was a project uh, a year or so ago that I was looking at called hierarchical namespaces within Kubernetes. There hasn't been a, an awful lot of progress on that. Um, people definitely recognize the need for something like namespaces. The minute you look at it, you love it, you want to use it a lot, but there isn't sufficient steam behind making that extremely useful. So I think aspects like those and improving aspects around those would be great. Do anyone want to add something? Yeah, so I have a slightly unrelated question since you brought up multi-tenancy. So what are your thoughts on multi-tenancy on a Kubernetes? As part of platform engineering, some uh, subset of people have platforms that spin Kubernetes clusters, right? Would, what are your thoughts on that? Should, would you prefer that over multi-tenancy or, you know, even the Mesosphere people were briefly doing that before they changed to DCOS. They, had, they were running Kubernetes clusters on Mesos. Yeah, I'm going to um, prepend my answer with a Yenni or RCL Vadi Akitika. So I think <laughs> the answer is it depends. It really depends on what I, I don't like this answer in a public forum at all for a lot of reasons, but I'm forced to give it today. But I think depending on what the needs of the team are, having Kubernetes clusters spun as part of a platform makes sense in some way, uh, but I don't think that is the exact problem that people are trying to solve 
with platforms. Having platforms spin up Kubernetes clusters, according to me, is like a vitamin. There's other important things that a platform needs to accomplish before getting to that point. We can probably discuss more offline uh, about this. I'd just like to um, mention that uh, it depends is a perfectly good answer, okay? <laughs> but having, having said that, um, I am very opinionated about this. Um, I see people getting very excited about um, being able to spin Kubernetes clusters. So they have one Kubernetes cluster per application, one Kubernetes cluster per team, one Kubernetes cluster per... Kubernetes is designed to operate at scale, right? And it gives you enough mechanisms to manage, make it fault tolerant, namespacing is there, RBAC is there, it gives you enough tools to manage your teams without having to spin one Kubernetes cluster per team, okay? I am very opinionated about this. Um, I've seen environments where there are dozens of Kubernetes clusters up and running. My suggestion, use Kubernetes for what it was intended. Run large platforms. Kubernetes can do that for you. It can do 100 to 100 nodes is nothing, right? It can do 500 nodes before it starts becoming complicated. So my suggestion is use the tooling provided by Kubernetes. Try to minimize the number of clusters. A cluster is intended to run thousands of applications. Um, you know, just create large clusters. Don't be afraid of them and manage them. Empower your teams. That's my impression, at least. Thank you. Thank you all. I still have a lot of questions, but due to time constraints, we had to cut this short. So I thank all the panelists for sharing their experience and insights on this specific topic. And I hope the audience finds this uh, discussion helpful and probably use this uh, discussion to navigate the challenges in this ever-evolving platform called Kubernetes. Thank you. Uh, may I request the panelists to stay back on the stage for a minute? Thank you. 